Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Lunchtime Learning webinar series. Uh, we're really excited for today's event. It is on a topic that uh, I think all of us uh, partake in, so it's something that we can all learn something about and how we can lower our impact in it. My name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the DEC co-lead of the Green New York Council, and I'm excited to have you here today. Um, just a couple programming notes before we get started. Um, first off, everybody is on mute uh, when you enter the webinar. If you do have questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box. We will be getting them to them at the end. We'll be reading off the questions. Uh, so if something does come up, you can just enter it into the chat at any time, and we'll get to the questions at the end. In addition, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be up on the Green New York website afterwards. So uh, if you wanted to go back and see any of the slides again, uh, re-see something, or if you want to send it along to any of your coworkers that maybe couldn't be here today, uh, you'll be able to do that. And again, that's right on the Green New York website. Uh, we're also excited that we've recently announced the next six months of webinars for the series. Uh, we've got sustainable clothing today. We've got sustainable outdoor recreation coming up in December. We have avoiding greenwashing in January, sustainable brewing in March. Then we have electric outdoor lawn equipment uh, in March. And then we also have sustainable summer uh, outdoor recreation in April. So we're really excited about our uh, upcoming series. And you can register for all of those on the Green New York website. So without further ado, uh, let's get into today's uh, presentation. I'm really excited to have uh, Beth Patenny here, who's going to present on sustainable clothing. So take it away. Hi, Brendan. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be part of this series. Very exciting. <laughs> I really appreciate your work. So um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called The, the Green Wardrobe Guide, and it, it basically came out of my, um, my work that I had been doing on toxins for many years before that. I run a small nonprofit organization called Green Inside and Out down here on Long Island. And um, it was kind of a natural extension of realizing that we're starting to eat healthy and eat organic, um, but most people weren't thinking about the clothing that they're putting on their bodies and what effects that may have on both our health and um, the environment. <clears throat> so I started to do some more research and unfortunately found out that the fashion industry is considered by the UN Conference on Trade and Development to be the second most polluting industry in the world, and that's after the oil industry. So what is it that's in our clothes? Most people would be surprised to, to know that there's quite a few chemicals in our clothing. There can be carcinogenic aromatic amines related to some of the dyes. Some of the dyes can be allergens. There can be heavy metals in some of the dyes, including cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, as you see there. Um, chromium is used in the tanning of leather, for example. Um, organotins is another set of chemicals. They're used as a textile preservative sometimes. Chlorinated benzenes, benzene is a carcinogen, and toluene is another toxin to the kidneys and liver and the nervous system. Flame retardants are often used in many textiles, such as polybrominated diethers, um, and the PFOS, which we may have heard of lately in the news. Formaldehyde is used to make clothing less wrinkle-prone. And phthalates, phthalates are um, plasticizers. They're, they're hormone disruptors um, that are sometimes used even in the ink on T-shirts. So another thing most people don't realize is that polyester is made of plastic. Um, as you can see there in the picture, it's terephthalic acid. Again, that word phthalate because the, the phthalates are in the plastic. Um, so, you know, polyester has its benefits. You know, we had our, our polyester pants from the 1970s and they're still around because it's a very durable product. Um, so in that way, it's great. It, you know, has longevity. Um, but it's also manufactured using antimony, which is a catalyst um, that causes cancer and it can be toxic, as you see there, to the lungs and, and so forth. So it has both its pros and cons. So what we're going to talk about today is um, some of the alternatives, or are some of the alternatives. So I got into this whole subject of cotton and organic cotton um, by way of studying pesticides. Um, as many of us are aware, pesticides have numerous health impacts. 
Um, there's a range of, uh, you know, different um, diseases that can be associated with certain pesticide use. Um, some are associated with cancer, such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, a few years ago, the World Health Organization came out with a report on Roundup saying that it, it may be a carcinogen. Um, certain pesticides are suspected of disrupting the body's hormone system, um, which, you know, either mimicking or blocking our natural hormones. Um, some pesticides, like insecticides, can be damaging to the nervous system. Um, so, thankfully, we have organizations like the DEC helping to protect us against all of these as a, you know, wide range of chemicals. Some are worse than others. But it's, it's so exciting to see the growth of the organic cotton industry because, um, you know, cotton is a natural product. Obviously, it's made from plants. Um, however, 25% of the world's pesticide use is used on cotton, believe it or not. So, Organic cotton is grown without pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, you know, just has to be uh, certified just like any other farms would be, like by NOFA and, and so forth, the third-party certification system that's managed by the USDA. And um, though it's a small percentage of the cotton market, it's definitely growing. Organic cotton now is grown in 18 countries, including here in the USA, in India, Turkey, Peru, China, it's grown on about a million acres as of right now, and it's actually a multi-billion dollar industry, which is really exciting. Um, <clears throat> one large athletic clothing vendor has committed to using over 50% organic or recycled cotton in its products, and even one of the major uh, fast fashion brands is, is doing the same thing. So it's really interesting to see some of these bigger companies really investing in the use of organic cotton, which is, you know, really encouraging to see and it's helping to grow the market quite a bit. So it's important to look for uh, the certain label, which is the Global Organic Textile Standard Label, or GOTS, as we call it, um, because that is a, a much stronger um, uh, standard that it's not only organic, but it goes all the way down through the the supply chain of when you buy an, an, you know, an item of clothing, it's throughout their whole um, manufacturing process from start to finish, which is really great. And it also includes um, standards for labor because unfortunately there's no guarantee that even orga organic cotton isn't being processed in, you know, what we would sort of term sweat sh sweatshop conditions. Um, so if you see the GOTS label, you're sure that that's not the case. And fair trade also, again, very, you know, similar in that it has um, standards for, you know, worker conditions and sort of takes out the middleman. So hemp is another fiber that we can use. And um, of course, the question always comes up when I give presentations about this. Um, <laughs> um, can, you, can you smoke your skirt? The answer is no. <laughs> Industrial hemp or cannabis sativa contains only about, um, as you can see, 0.03 to 0.05 of the chemical THC, which is, you know, what gives people a high. So um, different, different uh, part of the, different type of plant <laughs> within the same species. Um, hemp is actually a very hardy plant, just like its name, it grows like a weed. It can be harvested three times per year. Um, the fabric is very sturdy, and it kind of has the same feel as linen. Sometimes it's blended with cotton to make it a little softer. And hemp is exciting because it's been grown for at least 12,000 years. Um, even George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both cultivated hemp on their farms. So it, you know, can be used for twine and rope. It was even used for sails. It can be used for shoes. Many, many different uses for hemp. And I think um, probably, Brendan, you would know better than I would, but I know certain types of hemp can be grown um, in New York State, I believe. That is correct. Yeah, the state does have an industrial hemp program. Yeah, great. <laughs> so because it had been, you know, had been banned in the United States for many years, so things are slightly changing now just because of all these other uses for hemp. But bamboo is another type of um, plant-based fabric that we can look for. Um, bamboo is actually a type of grass, and it grows very rapidly. Um, when fabric is made from 
bamboo cellulose. It's often very soft. They commonly use it for yoga clothing and socks and towels and sheets. Um, but it's really fallen out of favor in some of the eco fashion circles because a lot of chemicals are used um, to process the cellulose, including sodium hydroxide, carbon disulfide. Um, so it's not one of the major favorites, but I put it there just as another option because you may see it in the marketplace. Another sustainable fabric that we can look for when we're shopping for clothes is um, Lyocell. Um, the trade brand is um, Tencel, uh, so you might see that on the label. It's made of eucalyptus trees. And this Lyocell is actually uh, pretty exciting because it uses a lot less water than cotton. Cotton is a very thirsty plant. In fact, it's said that 700 gallons of water is used to make just one cotton t-shirt. Um, and I should have mentioned before also with cotton, there's a lot of chemical use there just to make the cotton white and give it a luster. Um, there can be biocides used um, to prevent rot, you know, fabric softeners, all these chemicals used on typical cotton. Um, so Lyocell avoids a lot of that. Um, Modal is another type of cellulosic fiber. This one is made specifically from the cellulose of beech trees. And you can see there in the, um, in the picture at the bottom, it's like wood and then it's made into a pulp and then it's put through these spinnerets to make it into thread. So the, the fiber becomes a thread that can be used for clothing. And um, again, you know, there's the question of dyes. A lot of times you might be having a, a natural fabric with, you know, chemical dyes. So it's all a process of, you know, we're moving, the industry moving in the right direction eventually. So some of the other fabrics um, that are becoming used are soy, believe it or not. It's a byproduct of the soy, you know, food business. There can be um, cupro regenerated from cellulose from cotton waste. Injeo is actually made from corn biopolymers, believe it or not. Um, sea cell is a type of algae uh, fabric. They're, they're making it from like the, the fibers in, in algae. Um, linen is a very common one. Most people would be um, familiar with that. It's made from the flax plant. And another thing that you may see in the marketplace is recycled polyester. So, you know, again, this is kind of like a toss up because we're hearing about um, the microfibers ending up in waterways and they're so tiny they can pass through the um, sewage treatment plant, so they're ending up, you know, finding a lot of these, you know, bio, uh, these little, um, sorry, these polyester um, bits in the, in the ocean. However, if you're using recycled polyester, the argument there is at least we're keeping the waste out of the landfill for much longer. So there are some, you know, brand names that are using a lot of recycled polyester. So that's the one benefit of that. And we can actually make recycled polyester out of bottles. So it's, it provides a, a market for the, you know, the use of recycled bottles. So now I won't linger on this one too long. I know it's gross, <laughs> but I think it's just, you know, worth people being aware, you know, thinking through of, you know, when we're making purchases, where things come from. So, you know, there's a lot of people becoming vegan these days. Um, leather does, the industry does tend to push the meat market, which has carbon um, impacts on, on the planet as, as we're becoming more aware these days. Um, wool is, it's sheared from the sheep, but sometimes it's not the kindest um, method of, of doing things. Often, the, you know, sheep are, are injured in the process. Um, fur, you know, they use electrodes on the animal's snout and things like that. It's, it's just, I won't gross you out too much, but silk, they use silkworms and Often it means boiling them alive. Um, down, you know, the feathers are plucked from the duck's uh, chest and belly, as you see there in the picture. So just some things to think about. <laughs> um, but in terms of leather, I wanted to mention um, shoes because shoes can be really difficult to find eco-friendly. You know, I've, I've had hemp shoes, canvas shoes, but it's kind of exciting. Now there are alternatives like muskin. It's actually like a leather made from mushroom skin. Pinatex is made from pineapple skin. Um, I've even seen apple skin used to make alternatives for leather. So there are more and more alternatives, which are really exciting. 
And I always say it's the power of the consumer. It's what we, what we demand. <laughs> so when I was researching the book, um, I did some research on some of the high-end brands that you see there um, that you might see on a runway, because I, I was hoping to tell the story, well, you know, look, all these brand names are using some of these sustainable fabrics. Um, but unfortunately, I kind of found the opposite. A lot of the high-end brands weren't using the um, sustainable fabrics that we talked about. Um, only 14 out of 50 had a sustainability plan. But I definitely think that this is something that's changing. Um, it's, it's very exciting. Um, I'm a member of the New York City Fair Trade Coalition, and a lot of the um, young, you know, millennials that are at the Fashion Institute of Technology in the city and other fashion schools are really interested in sustainability. Um, they're using a lot of upcycled fabrics. There's actually an organization that um, in, in the state of New York that takes back uh, commercial, uh, like on a commercial scale, takes back unused fabrics. Like if a, a clothing manufacturer orders too many bats of a, of a material, they'll take it and resell it um, for others to use. And it's, you know, saving material that would other end, uh, otherwise end up in the landfill. So there's a lot of innovation happening as well, and it's encouraging. So I wanted to mention this as well, because aside from looking for the, the proper fabrics, um, or you know, more eco-friendly fabrics, I should say, um, one of the biggest impacts of our clothing is the way that we launder it. So one of the things that we can all do is try to look for eco-friendly bio-based detergents, um, preferably without fragrance, because fragrance is kind of a, a code word for chemicals. It can mean a lot of things. Um, fragrance can also contain phthalates, those hormone disruptors that we talked about before. Um, so it's best to avoid those if possible. There can be these laundry balls I use. Um, you know, they're, they contain these uh, orbs, basically like little, like little um, ceramic balls that make the water pH level um, change so that the it takes out the, the dirt out of your clothing and you don't have to use detergent at all. And when it comes to dry cleaning, um, I know New York State has a big effort on raising awareness on dry cleaning. Um, the Pollution Prevention Institute has worked on this quite a bit. And um, we can look for more eco-friendly dry cleaners that don't use perchloroethylene, which is a carcinogen that's used by the majority of dry cleaners. Um, wet cleaning is one option to look for. I know we have a bunch of them down here on Long Island. Um, Green Earth is another um, you know, brand of dry cleaning that is basically a silicone-based solution. So you can look for those in your communities. And also, it's always a matter of just using maybe cool water instead of hot, uses less energy, you know, running the machine when it's full, all those kind of tips. So I also wanted to make us aware that um, in terms of clothing and, you know, textiles, there's also bedding that's made of textiles. So when we're buying our towels and sheets, we can look for organic cotton or even hemp. Um, there are bamboo towels, like I mentioned. Um, and also we should be aware that a lot of our um, mattresses and you know, anything really made of cushions with polyurethane foam may contain the fire retardants, the PBDEs, as mentioned before. Um, those have been banned mostly in Europe, but they're still in use in the United States. Um, some of the adhesives may contain ethylene oxide, a probable carcinogen. So just to look for alternatives as much as we can. Like my own mattress is stuffed with organic cotton, and they use bromate um, as a as a fire retardant, which is pretty much you know inert in terms of human health. But important because we're spending at least you know hopefully seven hours a night sleeping. <laughs> so in terms of baby stuff, of course this is really important because um, children are very susceptible um, to the toxic effects of chemicals. Um, there can be flame retardants that are used in some pajamas. There's, there's been a rule on the books in the United States for many, many years now, a few decades, that um, to avoid fire, any loose-fitting pajamas have to contain uh, flame retardants. So it's recommended that 
um, you know, if you buy leggings that are tight fitting, they're less likely to contain the flame retardants. It's not required for those. Um, but there can be flame retardants in nursing pillows and cribs and changing pads. Um, so just something to be aware of. Maybe it's something to buy recycled at least. Um, and these chemicals can be associated with attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, hearing problems, and slow mental development. So I include in here also as part of having an eco-friendly wardrobe um, that our cosmetics and body care products are part of it as well. Um, right now under U.S. laws, um, cosmetic products do not need FDA approval before they go on the market. And the one exception to this is color additives. Um, so the FDA is able to regulate to a certain extent, but it's mostly, it mostly relies on the manufacturers um, to do a lot of the you know, testing on safety. So a few years back, the Environmental Working Group, based in Washington, D.C., a nonprofit organization, they did a study called Skin Deep and found that one-third of personal care products contain at least one chemical linked to cancer. Um, so again, something to be aware of. There's the safecosmetics.org. Um, there's a few ingredients to look out for here that I've mentioned. Phthalates, again, there are those hormone disruptors. Parabens, again, they're an antimicrobial preservative, but they're weakly estrogenic, so they can act in concert with um, our own natural estrogen. Um, nail polish contains formaldehyde, uh, which is a carcinogen, toluene, and phthalates. Um, but there are many alternatives available, so it's just a matter of being a smart consumer and, and looking for these things. And EWG put together an app, so you can actually just right on your phone, look up how eco-friendly a personal care product is. They have, you know, thousands of products in their database. So overall, where does the fashion industry need to go from here? Um, and it is moving in this direction, thankfully. Um, there are many organizations working on that. Is we need to pay more attention to the environmental impacts of our clothing, how they're produced, as well as the wearer's health, because um, we have the clothing next to our skin. Um, the garment workers' conditions, of course, very important. And uh, there's a movement towards cradle-to-cradle -to -cradle manufacturing, which is like a, a circular fashion economy, so to speak, to reduce the waste of resources. Um, we also need more transparency in clothing labels and traceability of how items are handled along the supply chain. So as mentioned, there are a bunch of different organizations that are working on all of these things. Uh, Global Organic Textile Standard. The, in Europe, there's a standard called Ecotex. Again, it's um, you know a res restricted uh, substances list, like an RSL, in other words, and Blue Sign Standard is, is very similar. Um, the HIG Index, that's something by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which again takes into account the workers' conditions. So things are moving in the right direction, and a lot of these, you know, name brands are seeking to, you know, bear these labels. So where do you find eco fashions? <laughs> There's a lot of boutiques that carry um, eco fashion. You can find um, you can find certainly these types of clothing online, and it's not all just for women. Um, There's definitely menswear that's eco friendly as well. And something I recommend is recycling and, and buying, um, in other words, repurposing clothing. So we'll get into that right here, in fact. So if you remember nothing else about everything I just said, <laughs> here's just the, kind of like the summary of how to green your wardrobe. Um, first of all, decide if you really need it. I mean, a lot of times we, we purchase clothing that um, we may not need and it ends up getting worn once and then um, thrown away. So one thing is just decide if you really need it. The second is determine if what you need could be found at a thrift store or a consignment shop or you know online sources that resell clothing. There's there be a, quite a few of those becoming more popular these days. Um, when you do need to seek new clothing, look for natural fabrics that have the least environmental impact, like we discussed earlier. Launder clothing using eco-friendly methods. Instead of tossing salvageable clothing, mend it, like if it just needs a button, it's something you can sew on. Um, 
And of course, this is the important part, donate clothing in good condition back to a thrift store so it can be reused. Because currently 85% of clothing is ending up in landfills. I'm actually working on a, a white paper on this right now that we hope to put out soon. So I put this in just for fun. Um, last year, I got to go to the, the um, World Fair Trade Summit in Peru. And uh, it was really wonderful. And we got to meet these women here that were using all natural dyes just from the nature around them, using the you know, minerals from the soil, the plants. Um, it was just really an incredible experience. So um, there are a lot of uh, uh, companies using natural dyes as well, like their, you know, earth tones. So I have some of that clothing in my wardrobe as well. It's really great. Like indigo can be used to make blue. It's beautiful. So I just want to thank the DEC for having me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Beth. That was fantastic, and that was a really good overview. Um, I really liked um, kind of the summary slide you had there as well at the end. Um, you know, we really like to go with a hierarchy approach with this stuff, and I think that's a, you did a really good job kind of explaining, you know, what people can do. Um, so we've got a, a couple questions here, and if folks have more questions, uh, feel free to type them into the chat box. And if you have any tips on what you've done for your wardrobe, uh, to make it green, um, you know, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll get to those questions. So the first one we have here uh, is one that uh, always pops up when we talk about different uh, eco-friendly products is costs. Are these, um, is there a price premium for some of these um, fabrics that are out there, like the organic cotton or the bamboo or the hemp or stuff like that? Yes, that's a great question. I should have addressed that because it always comes up. <laughs> um, so. It kind of varies. So organic cotton does tend to be a little more expensive than regular cotton. Um, but of course, it depends where you're buying. You know, if you're looking at Nordstrom, it's probably less expensive. Um, but, you know, compared to Old Navy, yes, it probably is more expensive because the farms have to be certified organic. Um, and, you know, it's they're doing a lot more. Um, there's a lot more labor in involved in avoiding the pests. It's a lot more monitoring and things like that. Um, so that's part of that. But hemp does tend to be expensive because most of it is grown abroad because we haven't been able to grow it here in the United States, so that's changing now. Um, bamboo tends to be pretty affordable. Uh, Tencel, the same. Uh, the Lyocell is pretty affordable. Um, and the, the other ones are just, you know, less common. It, it really depends on, you know, some brands use the fabric and charge quite a bit and others don't. So. That's, that's mm -hmm. pretty much the summary on that. <laughs> that that's good to know. Um, another comment that uh, we saw here was you mentioned uh, some sort of clothing made out of soy. Has anybody used the tagline tofu to teas yet? Ah, not that I've heard of. You might want to get a patent on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somebody's going to run out and trademark that now. Um, <laughs> I know so, I mean, a lot of the soy is genetically modified, so that's an issue, but... That's for another lecture some other day. <laughs> Everything is intersectional. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, so another thing here, and this has come up on another, uh, a bunch of our other presentations as well, is there's always trade-offs with this stuff. So you mentioned kind of the recycled polyester as being an example of this where, you know, you're, you're putting these into, you know, you're, you're using the recycled content, but it might lead to microfibers. Um, you know, there, there's other things like that. So with all these trade-offs for all of these, what do you personally go with when you're looking for kind of a new fabric or something like that? What do you focus on? Myself? Well, my first step, like I said in the summary, is I try to look for clothing at the thrift store. Um, and so then if I don't find it at the thrift store, then my first go-to is organic cotton, and I also love the Lyocell. So those are the two that I look for the most if I'm if I'm buying stuff online and being naughty buying stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually, you know, in, like I said, in New York City, of course, there's so many um, shops that sell. Like there's one that actually sells the clothing is made from fabric that's all from the cutting room floor, so all being recycled. So it's lots of innovation. So I look for that. <laughs> yep. So what fabrics do you recommend for winter sports other than wool? 
Hmm, that's a good one. Well, I actually have a coat that's made of recycled wool. It's not that common, but you can find it. Um, and I guess, you know, if, for winter sports, I would probably just look for the recycled polyester because a lot of those, um, those you know, those puffy types of jackets contain polyester fill. Um, so some of the major sportswear brands are using a lot of this, you know, recycled polyester. So that's probably the, the best option other than, you know, if you can look for humane wool. Actually, the Textile Exchange is an organization that has um, a label for humane wool and humane down. So if you can look for those labels, that's something to check for. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have, um, just off the top of your head here, any kind of places where people can look uh, to get more information regarding chemicals and clothing um, and issues such as uh, ADHD, hearing problems, things like that that you had mentioned before? Sure. Actually, um, I'm on the advisory board of a wonderful nonprofit organization called Fashion Forward. It's fashionfwd.org. So their main focus is the chemicals in clothing, and there's, there's quite a few other organizations like them, but they happen to be right here in New York State. So check them out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So are there any web pages that you know of where people can go to search for eco-friendly products and clothing like near me? Oh, um, near near you. I guess you'd have to do a Google search and see. Um, you know, in my book, I actually listed 200, um, not that I'm trying to sell the book, not allowed, <laughs> but in the book, I did list, you know, 200 um, eco fashion stores around the country and they're state by state. So New York has quite a few. And of course, California is way ahead of us. They have tons of eco fashion stores. Um, so a lot of it's online, you know, in the cities, you'll, you'll find boutiques that carry these things. So yeah, that's what I recommend. Mm -hmm. And I noticed someone put there that um, polyester is made of plastic, which is made of oil. It's a very good point. It's made from fossil fuels that we're wearing. Nylon and, and um, you know, all that is actually not recyclable either. Latex, not sorry, not latex, um, lycra not, is not recyclable. So that's a problem in that the industry. That's a really good point. And everything on these webinars comes back to climate change. Um, okay. You know, oil is in everything, um, more or less, it, it seems like when it comes to consumer products, and then you have the emissions from extracting it, refining it into a usable form for either plastics or other things. Another big issue with the, the apparel industry um, is the amount of travel that takes place. Um, a lot of this stuff is sourced one place in one country, then it's um, moved to another to be processed, then it's assembled in another country. Then it goes to another one for warehousing, then it goes to another one for final sale and distribution, and then, you know, whether it's recycled or not, the waste could end up somewhere else. So just the, the, the amount that this, this industry kind of moves things around um, adds to climate change as well. There's a lot of travel emissions as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a wonderful documentary called The True Cost. If anyone hasn't seen that, it kind of tells that whole story. Very educational. The true cost. It's all about the fashion industry. It came out a few years ago. Um, let's see. I'm just taking a look at some of the more questions here. Um, yes, this is being recorded. Um, so this will be on the Green New York website afterwards. If folks want to see that, that's come in a couple times. Um, wow, these are great questions. I see quite a few. And anyone can reach out uh, afterwards. You have my email there. <laughs> yep. Um, could you comment on the sustainability of the linen industry? Um, that I don't know too, too much about, but I believe it's, it's fairly sustainable. I haven't heard of, um, you know, flax and linen causing any major environmental damage um, because, you know, it can be used for many things, inc including omega-3s <laughs> if, you're, if you're vegetarian. Um, but, you know, again, the, nothing's perfect. so. Even if you have linen, sometimes they, it might have toxic dyes on it. Um, but, you know, we do the best we can and things are moving in the right direction. But I haven't heard any major impacts from, from flax. So linen is probably a good choice. And, you know, these things are biodegradable as well. Mm -hmm. 
And do you have any information on the reduction of potential chemical content of textiles over time, so things like off-gassing? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, when I researched the book, it was, it was a few years ago, and at that time I couldn't find any, like, major studies that really um, tracked the health impacts of the chemicals, like, absorbing into our skin um, and the, the off-gassing. I know off-gassing, for example, is an issue with the perchloroethylene when you dry clean your clothing. It's actually recommended that if you use perk to take the, you know, plastic bag off outside so any um, any of the perk can off-gas to the outdoors rather than into your closet. Um, but there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. I'm really curious about that myself. Because, you know, sometimes when you bring new clothing home, you, it has a certain odor to it. You can smell the chemicals. Yeah, and that also you had mentioned before um, getting into uh, bedding and linens and stuff like that. That's also kind of a consideration with looking at mattresses and um, things you're going to spend, you know, sheets and all that you're going to spend a lot of time in, too. So, right, um, right. To yeah. for those products as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, over over time when you wash things, um, the, the chemicals, you know, do tend to leach out, of course, but then it's going into our waterways and has to be treated by our sewage treatment plants. So we'll see in a few decades, we hope <laughs> things will just keep improving, especially for, for workers. Um, you know, that's important when you're, you know, workers that are working with these fabrics and dyes all the time for their health and their communities. A lot of it is being yeah. produced in China and India, but, you know, some of it here in the United States, too. And so we've had a couple questions here regarding the best thing to do with clothing that can't be mended or repaired instead of throwing it into the landfill. Can you speak a little bit about kind of considerations when it comes to what to donate to, you know, thrift stores versus, you know, textile recovery and things like that? Yeah, so actually, um, I've just been, I, I actually have a radio show on, on a WUSB, if anyone ever wants to listen, down here in Stony Brook. Um, so for the radio show, I've been interviewing some, some people that work in this industry, and, um, and the True Cost talks about this also, that documentary I mentioned. So it seems to be that the system is, when clothing is donated, um, it, you know, it, it either goes to like a place like Goodwill or, you know, some other organization where it's sorted as to what they think they can sell, um, and that goes to the thrift store. And anything that can't be sold um, ends up being sorted into these like big bins, uh, like big um, uh, bales, basically, of different types of clothing. And oftentimes they are sent to, if they're really not in good condition, they're used for the rag industry and for um, insulation purposes, so they get shredded. Um, but otherwise, they end up going often to developing nations where there's like a secondhand um, clothing industry, believe it or not. So even, and it's kind of an ethical thing. I've been trying to figure this out. Like if you donate clothing that you want to go to be used for someone in need, but someone else is reselling it, I, you know, there's a little bit of an ethical issue there, but nonetheless, it's still keeping the clothing out of the landfill down, down the line. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It's like a whole, whole second secondary industry. <laughs> and one, uh, another thing too that I'd like to thank one of our um, frequent um, viewers for pointing out in the comments here is that New York State does have a searchable database for textile recovery locations, um, mm -hmm. and that's through the New York State Association for Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling, or NYSAR three. So if you search for that, um, textile recovery locations, they do have a really good uh, resource where you can find places where you can take old textiles and then they'll be processed. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you for pointing that out. That's right, I, I have heard of them, yep. There there was mm -hmm. a campaign um, in, I think it was in Westchester or the Hudson Valley area um, called Reclothe New York um, and getting people to you know recycle their clothing and, you know, New York City has, has some great innovations going on, like they're trying to keep clothing out of the landfill. So um, even the sanitation department of the city is involved in, um, like, putting bins in multifamily housing to make it easier for people. It's really great. I'd love to see more happening out here in the suburbs where I live. <laughs> 
Um, so when shopping, is country of origin also a concern when you're looking for um, various types of clothing? And I guess that kind of gets into the question of fair trade and stuff like that as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it kind of is an indication when, when you see um, certain countries, like developing countries where most clothing is, is made. Um, they might not have the, the best standards, like as high as we have here in the United States. But, you know, even that is changing because there's so much consumer pressure um, and demand for better conditions for workers because no one wants to feel like they're, you know, paying someone a dollar a day to make their T-shirt. Um, in fact, a few years ago, you may have heard in the news, there was a collapse of a, a building in, in Rana Plaza in um, uh, Bangladesh and, you know, several hundred people died, unfortunately. And so it really shone a light on the, the need for, you know, fair trade, like we were talking about before, um, just making sure the labor conditions are, are better. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, there's also considerations with some countries as well when it comes to cotton production. I know the U.S. has a ban on cotton imports from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan because of the use of slave labor uh, in harvesting the cotton. So that's one where, you know, there is a ban on selling cotton from those countries in the U.S., but, um, you know, just something to look out for as well. So another question here came in about vegan leather and the sustainability of the processing of that. Do you have any information on that compared to kind of the tanning process? Um, not, not too much because it's, it's an emerging industry, so I'm not really sure on that. I'd have to look. You know, I'm sure it's not perfect either. Um, unfortunately, nothing seems to be <laughs> in this world, but um, at least I think it's an improvement over, you know, the, the animal cruelty thing and the, the climate change effects of using leather from, from cows. But, but, you know, again, that's like an ethical issue because a lot of the alternatives to leather are using plastic. And so then you get back into, well, it's made from fossil fuels. And so <laughs> that has an impact too, so. Yeah, yeah, that's something we need to do more research on. I'm, I'm very curious myself. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that's very processed, even if you're taking, you know, mushrooms or, you know, apple peels and somehow turning that into something that feels like leather. There's there's a lot of processing that goes into that, and any time you have that kind of a processing of, a, of an item that much, there, there's the potential to have a lot of in, impacts on it. Right, right. Um, that's the importance of the transparency, you know, I think a lot of the, the smaller manufacturers are willing to be more transparent than maybe some of the bigger companies. So it's another consideration. And one other question here that got into chemicals that are in beauty products. Are there any kind of searchable databases or anything else where folks can learn more about um, what's in cosmetic products? Yeah, there's a nonprofit organization called safecosmetics.org. I had that on the slide there. And um, let me see, can I go back? I'll show you that app from Environmental Working Group. Um, this one, it's called the Healthy Living app, and they have a whole database um, of products. So you put the product in and it tells you, it, it gives you a ranking of how, you know, safe slash eco-friendly the product is. And with that, uh, we've got one more comment here that says that uh, this person repurposes old T-shirts and uh, softer fabrics as rags. That's a really good way to, you got something that's, that's non-mendable, you can get kind of a second use out of it. Um, you're doing the reuse right in your own place instead of having to send it out somewhere else to be processed to be uh, reused as well. So yep. with Great. that, uh, yeah, do you have any final thoughts to leave people with today? Um, no, I think that's it. I just want to thank everyone for having me. It's really, it's really great. And I think the most important thing is just to keep these things in mind that, you know, being a conscious consumer and is doing the best we can and supporting the, you know, the manufacturers that are trying to do the right thing is, is really great. So moving in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for presenting today. And I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to be on the webinar today and for your thoughtful comments and um, questions. You know, it always uh, it always adds to the discussion here and uh, we really enjoy having it. So thanks again, Beth. This was fantastic.
If you do want to uh, view a recording of this or share it with someone else, it will be up on the Green New York website soon. Uh, and our next webinar is going to be taking place on Tuesday, December 8th, and it is on sustainable winter recreation. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good one.